evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of ATC, ATC's board, I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us this evening. In this age of endless digital events, we know that your screen time is valuable, and we're just really grateful uh, that you decided to spend an hour with, with ATC. I was personally thrilled to see ATC publish its first ever impact report last week. This was the culmination of several months of work by ATC staff who have really pivoted and, and changed the entire structure of providing services to help their clients during an unprecedented and heartbreaking year. And uh, as a board, we really had the opportunity to join some of the work sessions uh, that were a part, of this, part of the development of the three-year strategic plan. And I found these sessions incredibly fruitful and informative. And I think the virtual environment that we've all come to know quite well actually provide an opportunity for ATC staff and board to kind of come together in a way that may not have been possible in quote unquote normal times. And one of the salient themes of the discussions centered on how ATC can articulate its impact. And as an organization, ATC has always been laser focused on client relationships and providing unconditional support. Um, and we wanted to consider how you speak to that impact while keeping people at the core of everything. And I think the impact report really does achieve that objective. And as Charles so eloquently articulated in his introduction to the impact report, homelessness is a humanitarian crisis. It is a human crisis. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from ATC's team this evening on the strategic plan for the next three years. And then for uh, to take your questions and have a, a good discussion at the end of this evening. And so with that, it's, it's my distinct privilege to introduce Charles Lerner, who is ATC's executive director. So I'm gonna turn it over to Charles who will take us through um, a few remarks. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, thank you for everybody that is on the call tonight. Uh, tonight is a, a smaller intimate group of uh, some of our biggest supporters who are on the phone with us tonight so that we can share out what we've been up to over the last year and where we're headed. It's gonna be a lot more opportunities like this to engage our community because really that is one of our major um, goals over the next few years is to mobilize as many people um, to really persist um, together in solving what is our um, region's most pervasive social issue. Um, obviously with uh, uh, COVID being the most acute uh, short-term, hopefully short-tish term um, uh, social issue that we're facing, once we hopefully move beyond and through that, um, we, we will still have um, uh, chronic homelessness uh, awaiting us um, on the other end of COVID. So ATC is really intent on getting bigger and bolder and addressing um, that issue. And we need all of your support. And so that's the first thing I wanna say uh, tonight is thank you for all of you on the phone and thank you to all of our supporters um, who have stood by us. Uh, I've been at ATC now for 18 months and um, you know it became very clear early on that ATC has a, a group of very long-term committed supporters that are helping us be able to do the important work that the organization does. And um, it, it really um, is not just a talking point to say that um, we tremendously appreciate um, your help um, and standing by us. Uh, the number one question that I've uh, gotten this this past nine or 10 months uh, from a lot of people in the community and funders alike um, is uh, how the organization is doing, how COVID has impacted us, um, and most importantly, how it's impacted our, our clients. And uh, so we wanted to share a little bit about that. We, we talked a little about that in the impact report, um, but we want to talk a little bit more about it tonight and answer some of your questions. I will say that, um, you know, as an executive director of, of an organization that obviously I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, you the one thing that you don't really get executive director training on is is how to run an essential organization during a once in a lifetime pandemic. Um, and so it it was it has been a very trying and challenging time, a time of uncertainty. Um, but with that said, uh, through your support, but also um, through having an unbelievable team of people at At The Crossroads, um, we have, I feel like, weathered this storm really well. Um, and we've never lost sight of what our mission is. Um, and we have not retracted um, from staying engaged with our clients. And, and when I say engaged, I mean face-to-face, -face, um, uh, showing up uh, in, in the way that uh, ATC has done for 22 years. 
Um, I tease uh, our team a lot uh, to say that even if I made the decision nine months ago that we were going to go to teleservices, I would have been booed and kicked out of the uh, out of the door. Um, and so it was made very clear to me unanimously from our team that we were going to continue to have a presence on the streets. We were going to continue to have face to face contact with our clients and make sure that we had a presence in their lives, um, maintain a presence in their lives uh, that is so critical to our clients. Um, so I wanted, I'm really excited that our, uh, Damari Miller uh, is uh, joining us tonight because um, he can share a little bit more about what the last nine or 10 months has looked like more on the ground and from the perspective of our, our program team. Um, he is a person that has a level of sensibility um, that very few people I've worked with in my career have, um, and that's come in handy over the last nine or 10, 10 months. And it's that level of sensibility, compassion, non-judgment, um, and laser focus on human beings and showing up for human beings that makes him an effective leader of our team. Um, and that what, that, and, um, what makes ATC so, um, so unique um, and so impactful. So I'd like to introduce everyone to Demarie. Uh, thanks a lot, Charles. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I wanna start off uh, by thanking the program team for their commitment to the work, which isn't easy under normal circumstances, uh, let alone this crisis. But I think they've all been able to act with a lot of thought and to great effect. Um, you probably heard this a lot, but these are trying times and during them I found myself navigating many firsts. The pandemic created a new normal and it's uh, shifted our approach to programming. Um, first of all, we had to prioritize the safety of our staff and the community we serve. This included prioritizing the distribution of hygiene supplies such as hand sanitizer, soap, masks, and providing literature about the virus, which we constantly updated as information became more available. Um, as with the case with many other Americans, our clients have experienced an economic and social strain as consequences of COVID-19. We've increased food supplies, clothing, and our ability to provide financial relief as an attempt to supplement material support during this time. A current problem I've observed is around isolation. Although we're still conducting nighttime outreach and in-person appointments due to the need for safety, we're not able to interact with clients in the same ways we have in the past. Um, we're in the midst of change. The recent election and this virus are mammoth events with global implications. However, the problems we face did not appear overnight. And I think this is really important. Um, people have always needed housing. People have always needed food. And most importantly, people demand respect. The population we work with has already been facing challenges around health, poverty, and isolation. Current circumstances just highlight this fact. Um, and with that being said, there's beauty to be found in this work as well. During a time where everything seems to have such worldly consequences, it's been grounding to see the changes we've been able to make on an individual effort. Clients finding houses and achieving their own self-identified goals is something I always look forward to and continues to happen even during this time. Um, this virus has shown more than ever how connected we are. I think it's important to keep this in mind moving forward. We're only as safe as our most vulnerable. And I think empathy at this point isn't just a moral approach, but a common sense one as well. And with that being said, I'd like to kick things back to Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. I was uh, actually answering one of the questions in the chat um, and uh, to Clive, and I don't know if it actually went through at least the answer to the first question, but um, we'll make sure to answer it before the uh, end of the evening. Um, so we talked a little bit about where we've been and we'll answer some more questions if folks are, are interested um, in more specifics about the last uh, nine or 10 months. Uh, I just wanna say that um, some of you, one of the questions that came up already is how um, ATC has been able to increase its revenue over um, uh, this past year, over the previous year. 
Um, and I think I put it in the chat box. I'm not sure if it actually went through. If it didn't, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that a little bit later. Um, but we have, we were very fortunate to have a good uh, fiscal year last year from a fundraising perspective. And again, several of you on, on this phone call were part of that success. Um, and it's really fortunate that we did. Um, this year we're doing okay. Um, we're, we're operating on about a balanced budget, um, which is the good news. Um, we have leveraged uh, a good amount of resources from last year to dramatically increase, increase as Dee had mentioned, our, our food support, hygiene supply support um, to our uh, clients during this really critical time. We've invested right from day one. Um, it was really a position of mine that we would never go without um, adequate PPE. So we have consistently invested um, in PPE for our staff and, and by the way, our clients as well in distributing um, hand sanitizer and masks. Um, and uh, we've also uh, provided some additional staff support um, during this time. Um, so I, I, I think that um, answer hopefully went through with Clive. If not, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but really what I'd like to do in terms of closing, in terms of our presentation, is just talk a little bit about where the organization is going over the next couple of years um, and some of the, the key initiatives that you can expect. These will be on our website. Um, we'll share these via uh, upcoming communications. Um, and, uh, and then we'd love to just field uh, some questions from, from folks that we don't get to talk to um, nearly enough. So where we're headed uh, over the, um, the, the next few years, and I, I don't want to like read you the impact report, so I just want to make a couple comments and sort of share where these came from. Um, as Charlotte mentioned, uh, it was important, and this is not always the case, uh, uh, for nonprofits, um, uh, it was really important that we receive feedback um, and that really our whole organization, board, staff, volunteers, donors, um, clients, it was really important for us to, to um, get a sense of uh, creating a shared vision. Um, because one of the things I, I like to say as a nonprofit leader is this organization is not mine. It's not the current employees, the board of directors. A nonprofit organization, and hopefully one that um, is sustainable and lasts for a very long period of time, is really the community's agency. It's your organization. It's the people who are on this phone, and many more people. Um, you know, I think this is a social issue that people feel very um, discouraged about, disempowered about, frustrated, angry, sad. All of these emotions that people feel, um, and I think many of many people. I mean, they would just love to, to, to go on the streets and make sure people have food, make sure people have basic needs, make sure they have housing, um, and they can't. They, they, they individually can't do that. And so they invest in organizations like ours, um, and we do the work. And hopefully we do that work really effectively in a way that makes um, our investors or people who support our organization proud. Um, and so tonight is, is, is part of that, and the impact report is part of that, is, is to have a high level of transparency so that our supporters know what we're up to and can ask questions. And we want many opportunities for that level of engagement. So there are a few things uh, in terms of what, uh, where we're headed. And um, ATC is, is a respected leader, actu um, not actually, it's a respected leader um, in, with our key stakeholders and city leaders. People know about ATC and they believe we add tremendous value. The reason why I say actually is, is because far too people, far few uh, people know about ATC. Um, and that is one of our um, goals over the next few years is to really increase our profile. But along with that comes taking a little bit more risks, getting out there, um, sharing our point of view more. Um, so you will be seeing soon an upcoming um, social marketing campaign that we are really excited about that will be launching in the next couple of weeks that we will share with you very shortly. Um, it also means taking some risks potentially um, and maybe sitting at some tables that we're not used to sitting at, um, engaging perhaps public partners in a way we haven't historically engaged. Um, one of the choices we made was to be part of the Rising Up program, which is a public-private partnership through HSH um, and other nonprofits. We decided to enter into that pilot project, um, which was a, a new experience for At the Crossroads. Um, but we also wanna create larger, larger scale change, macro level change. And so um, whether it's our participation on the Alternatives to Policing uh, Steering Committee, which is not about necessarily 
um, uh, eradicating police, but it is um, reducing the need for police because there are many services and supports that we can actually offer people um, as an alternative to policing. Um, so those are a couple of examples of how we've actually built alliances and partnerships. The other thing that I am committed to doing as a non, um, nonprofit leader is looking at the duplication of services between nonprofits, um, removing some of the silos between nonprofits, and, and really delivering a more coordinated response. Um, because the reality is, is that nonprofits, even with the best of intentions, sometimes perpetuate um, and actually create some of the gaps that exist for our clients. And ATC does not want to be part of that, that problem. Um, there's a couple other things I, I mentioned earlier about um, really engaging our community of supporters. We want you along this ride with us. We want you to be engaged. We want you to challenge us. We want you to ask questions, excuse me, questions. Um, some folks may not be interested in that. They may, they may very much believe in the mission of ATC, um, value what we're doing, make a contribution, you know, have a little bit of interaction. Um, and of course, that's very valuable to the organization and other people want to be more engaged and we want to find uh, opportunities for people to do that. Um, we are going to be, um, and I'll talk about this in a second, going to be undergoing um, uh, a needs assessment. And that was one of the outcomes of our strategic plan was that ATC has a particular model. Um, it's the reason why I came to this organization and I shared a little bit in my introduction letter in the uh, impact report. It's why I came here, the way we do relationships, um, how long we stick by our clients, uh, the level of non-judgment um, and dignity and humanity in which we do our work um, is unlike anything I've experienced in 22 years of working in nonprofits. Um, and it's certainly unlike anything I've experienced personally as being um, somebody who has accessed services throughout my life, um, especially earlier on when I, I myself experienced um, homelessness. So um, I am so proud of that model and now the question for us is we're not going to move away from that model. We are, we are not going to move away from supporting some of the most disconnected youth and young adults in our city. The question is, is where does the organization go next? Um, and we are beginning or we have been having some of those conversations. Um, and so part of our next step is to determine for the organization, do we go wider? Do we go deeper with our clients? Um, considering homelessness is, is really a national issue, but certainly a regional issue here in the Bay Area. Um, how do we track our clients? How do we support clients when they move out of the city or get, you know, find housing outside the city? Um, you know, how can we contribute even more than we're already contributing? Um, and part of that is, is also, um, and most of our supporters have, have heard from us about this, that we have been engaging Stanford um, on a data collection project to look at how we measure impact. How do we measure um, the impact that long-term relationships have on the lives of the people that we work with in potentially non-traditional ways? Some of our clients may not be housed through the work that we do with them. Um, we're not going to remove potentially for some of our clients the, the mental health challenges they might have. Um, we're not going to potentially, unfortunately, be able to um, support them in getting out of poverty or um, struggling you know, um, with some, many of the struggles that they have. But that does not mean we're not having an impact and we need to be able to measure that more effectively. And so we'll be definitely um, providing some more details around that. Um, and the last thing I'll just say, and then, we'll, then I'll just get into a couple more specifics, um, is that we are really wanting to invest in our staff. And I know that somebody had a question about you know, this was this is one of our six initiatives for the next uh, 15 to 18 months, and 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 um, it's interesting that that question came up because um, with full transparency, one of our board members asked that same question of us. But here's the deal: the reason why it's an initiative for at least the next 15 to 18 months is is because we have amazing staff, and we need to slow down and we need to ensure that they're well cared for, that um, they're you know that we take as good care of our staff as we attempt in terms of providing support for our clients, that we provide opportunities for growth within our organization so we don't lose staff when they go to graduate school, um, when they're done with graduate school, they go to another agency to potentially play a role in another agency that, that ATC actually could potentially provide within our own organization, which is part of um, scaling up the organization and considering some options for the organization. Um, that there's more opportunities for leadership and hearing their voices, 
so we really want to invest in in our in our um, staff, and we want to use the opportunity we have when they're with us um, to provide the mentorship and professional development that they deserve to uh, become future leaders of organizations in in our community. So. Let me just give you a couple of quick specific, more specifics about sort of what to expect over the next year or two and what you could hear from us in terms of uh, um, how we're going to get where we want to go. Um, uh, so yeah, on the screen, you can see uh, the three major strategic directions. I, I probably have already alluded to, to, to many of these. Um, as I said, uh, we're going to continue um, to work on this data collection project that should be finalized here in the next couple of months. We're actually moving on to the next phase here soon, the implementation phase, and to potentially pilot um, some uh, pilot a, a study with some of our clients. Um, again, we really want to, to mobilize those of you that are on the phone and all of those in our community to be more involved with us and to hear from us more. Um, as I mentioned around the work culture, um, we really want to we want to be a model nonprofit of uh, for how you treat your staff, but um, also um, as a side, um, that it's no longer acceptable for me as a nonprofit leader, but certainly I think in the nonprofit sector, it should not be acceptable to underpay people um, and expect people simply to work for the mission while they themselves are struggling financially and being able to afford to live in the Bay Area. So these are some of the conversations that we have been having um, internally. There are other things that we're doing within the organization. We continue to look at, at how ATC can create more inclusion and equity within our own organization and promote it, promote it externally. Um, so you can read certainly in the impact report some of the next steps that we're taking, but you've heard certainly enough from me and I'm sure we can, I can answer a couple of specific questions when we go to the Q&A, which I would like to invite everybody to come back on the screen um, and join me. Um, to hear from our our our, uh, our supporters. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, everybody, Charlotte and Demarie, for speaking. Um, we have some questions from the audience, and I again would invite, um, in case anybody just joined, if you have a question, we're going to start having a discussion. Um, but if you have a question that comes up during our discussion, please put it in the Q and A. Uh, we'll do our best to get to them. Um, but we already have a few to get started. Some are a little bit specific, but I'm happy to throw them out there. So we have, um, Charles, you answered the, the questions from Clive um, in your presentation. So I think that one I would consider to be answered. Um, one question we have from Susan Mulvey, which is, um, she says that ATC is terrific at meeting our clients and working with them to reach their goals. And she wanted to know how many of our clients have the goal of finding a home um, versus th th where that is not a top priority and maybe for the moment they are comfortable staying on the street. And so that's the starter question. And then the second follow-up was just, what is the process of finding housing for our clients? So she just wanted to know a little bit more about that process. Um, so my first thoughts about um, how to answer that are, I think one thing that really um, sets us apart and a thing I enjoy about being here is that we work with people through ebbs and flows. And what that means is I've had with the same client, it shifted. So I will say the majority of our clients um, that are unhoused do wanna find housing, but I will also say there are clients that prefer to stay outside. Um, some of that can be anxiety, and some of it actually speaks to, well, I would hope it speaks to how labyrinthine and dangerous people find the shelter system to be, or to find the housing process to be to where they elect to be outside rather than go through this process that can, for some people, um, be exhaustive and traumatic. Um, so in that main answer, I'd say majority of people, but also working with people in ebbs and flows means that this answer I'd say with a lot of individuals, it's everything. Like I've worked with people that initially wanna find housing, but then they might be couch surfing for a while and they're content with that. Then they get into a really big argument and they're outside and they wanna go back towards working on it. So I think one of the main things to do is to be as consistent as possible with uh, clients and to be as honest as possible and to be as flexible as possible 
And from what I've seen, the only times it really works is when you let people come to conclusions themselves. And then we just kind of try to help them drive after that. Thanks, T. Yeah, I think if there's anything I've learned from our program team, it's that working with clients is not it's not linear. It's we're working with people and people's lives change. They change every day. They change on a dime. And really ATC is, is there to, to be supportive um, no matter what is coming up for our clients. Um, nice. Uh, in a similar vein, um, I, there was a question about what percentage of our clients have uh, mental health issues. And I, Wanted to, I know that that's not necessarily something that everybody holds in their brain. So I was actually pulled up the 2019 point in time count just um, real quick is uh, the point in time count happens every other year. Um, it's something where the city um, and city agencies try to get together to do our best to do sort of like a census of um, who is currently actively experiencing homelessness. It's not perfect by any means, um, but it is what the process that we have and it does give us some information. They also do an accompanying survey. And so for the youth youth count that they did in 2019, um, young people experiencing homelessness reported uh, about 48% reported having psych psychiatric and emotional conditions, 43% um, reported having post-traumatic stress disorder um, and 30% of youth say that a mental health is one of the contributing causes to their um, homelessness. So I just wanted to throw that, those stats out, um, but I also wanted to open it up if anyone wanted to take on that question beyond the, the numbers themselves real quick. Um, I just wanted to quickly say to um, an important thing to consider is that experiencing poverty and trauma, which a lot of our clients do, even if they might not diagnose it, would take a toll on anyone's mental health as well. And kind of like in speaking to the nonlinear um, process of working with people, I would say that um, we use the term resilient a lot. And I would definitely say our clients are resilient, but I also feel like that underscores like the reality of what they're going through and that pain. So to a degree, I don't know how many clients have disclosed it, but I would say to an extent, every single person I work with has had um, experienced trauma or loss. Well, I was just going to piggyback off of what Dee said. Um, you know, I was a therapist. That's what I did before I got into the work that, that uh, ATC does, but also the work prior, the 10 years prior to coming to ATC. Um, and so like the question of mental health um, for me, um, is, you know, mental health is really on a continuum in terms of wellness, right? And so people can be on very different ends of that continuum in terms of, um, and it's individual, you know, uh, but it can be mentally, their, their mental wellness can be really, really solid and, and they could be doing really, really well at, at, at a particular moment uh, in time or phase. Um, and then they might not be. Right, and, I, and I'm imagining that many people on the call and many people who maybe have not been quote unquote diagnosed with a mental health diagnosis um, have had, most of us, if not all of us have had periods in our time where um, our mental wellness has not been good. And um, so I think like it's a really hard question to answer because like there are many people who uh, maybe have not been diagnosed maybe know that they've experienced, as D is saying, a lot of trauma and a lot of hardship, but don't label themselves as somebody with mental illness or, or mental health issues. And then there are many people who don't necessarily, they seem to be doing very well on the surface um, and have not been diagnosed with mental health issue and, and probably could be. I mean, so mental, mental well-being and mental health is such a very, uh, I hope I didn't just go out of tangent, but is a very dynamic and challenging thing to unpack. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit uh, because there's a, there's a question about strategic, our strategies, our strategic plan. And then I also, we'll do our best to get to everybody's questions. I see some questions about volunteering. I think I'll try to get to those a little bit later. Um, and I, I also have some questions for the panel. So uh, one question from our um, audience is about our strategy and whether it includes any lobbying of the city. Um, to provide more funding or support for policy changes. Um, 
So questions about the specifics of our kind of mobilizing and, and advocacy. That's a great question. And um, so for, and I don't know if Charlotte, you wanna jump in on this as well, but um, we, what you see with the strategic plan is really a, a, a very clear focus for the next two to three years. Um, and the initiatives you're hearing about that are in our impact report are for the next about 12 to 15 months. But what the group is going to do, because this, this issue is so fast changing um, and the organization is still thinking about, okay, for 22 years, we have done what we do so consistently, but we actually wanna leverage the success we've had to think about new opportunities for ATC. Um, and so we're really gonna be going through that process over the next six to nine months to kind of think about where we might wanna add services and add programs um, or add programming. One of, the, uh, one of the things I do expect for us to do, not this next year, but um, once we're complete with some of the initiatives we're working on over the next 12 to 15 months, is start to explore how ATC can get more involved with policy um, and advocacy. And it's an important question for us to think about. How do we, we have, we have, um, we have a point of view and we do wanna shape policy and we do wanna create, as I said earlier, larger scale change. We have to accomplish some other things first, but we also have to think about how we can develop the bandwidth and the infrastructure within the organization to do that. Um, and quite frankly, if with more funding, we may have been um, prepared sooner rather than later and maybe make, taking that next step and adding a position or working with someone around, around policy. Um, so we just, we're, we're kind of, just to be quite honest, thinking about priorities and what we can fund and then whether that still makes sense for us. Thank you. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to ask, and this is kind of for Charles, but for really anybody, is thinking about how this coming year is really a, about foundation building. So I think, Charles, you shared a little bit about the larger vision, um, which was on that graphic with the, you know, the, the sun shining over the city of San Francisco. <laughs> um, and I think over the next 12 to 15 months, we're doing a lot of um, sort of foundation building so that we can be building towards that larger vision. And I just, I think I wanted to think more broadly about what is it going to take for us to get from that foundational, you know, from building the foundation to, to that larger vision that, that is a little bit um, like, you know, we've talked a lot this year about building a more equitable Bay Area for all and the, these bigger issues. So I just thought it might be nice for you know, people to reflect on how they see us getting from where we're at now to those larger goals. Yeah, I was, because uh, I've spoken a lot, I'm wondering, um, you know, I'm curious, Charlotte, can I put you on the spot? <laughs> so, of course, because, you know, board of directors, they, they have similar questions, right? Like, this is very sort of like global, like, there's vision here, it sounds all like a great picture you're painting. Um, but like, how are you going to get there? We want to see like the, the very specific. So I'm just curious from like the board's perspective, as you've gone through this process over the next, the last 12 months or so, how do you, how would you answer that question? Yeah, no, thanks for, I think it's a great question. Um, and I just reflecting on the past, yeah, six or seven months that we've been working on this. I mean, I think, um, I remember the board, we were, we were sort of pushing you all to think about, okay, we have these lot, you know, really aspirational forward think forward looking sort of um sort of strategic outpost right but how do you actually get the work done what are the milestones what are the metrics i think there was a, a really you know we've been having discussions over the past couple months on you know you know this like are you just thinking about output or what are you how are you actually measuring your success how are you actually thinking about it and so i think being very intentional about, you know, how do we know that we actually achieve these these milestones? How do we know that we actually, you know, built a, you know, built a really supportive environment for our staff? Like, how will we know that? And so I don't think that I think we're seeing that built into. I know the team developed a very um, robust sort of work plan. So actually looking at the steps you get, um, I think that's important because otherwise, if you have such broad, lofty goals, you may not necessarily hold yourself, uh, you know, to to really strong sort of um, uh, key results. And so I think um, as a board, we're really looking forward to supporting you, Charles, and, and the staff and asking those questions to see if, you know, you know, have you actually reached 
the outpost or the milestone or the, you know, the, the signpost on that, on that uh, road that you showed us. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of the hard work was done this year. I think really crystallizing um, the strategic plan was, was not easy. You know, we really sort of had to carve out the language and the, and the, and the metrics. So that's kind of how I think about it. And we're going to be here to support you all on it, on this journey, on this road. Thanks. Yeah, and, and you know there are. Um, I'm glad you brought that up, Charlie, because there, there. I sort of forgot to mention that we did spend countless hours putting work plans together to actually do some of the things we're talking about doing, um, and a couple more specific projects that we'll be working on. I mentioned the data collection project because one of the things that um, ATC has has not, um, especially because of the size of the organization, and this is not uncommon with nonprofits, but we we wanted to test our assumptions about our impact. So were we having the impact that we thought or we think we're having on clients um, and are we actually having impact that we didn't know we're having so that was um, so that is part of the pilot projects so that's a specific uh, project that we're going to be working on to take a look at impact and then do we want to make modifications to our approach to our program model based on those findings um, you mentioned sort of professional development and creating a, a diverse equitable and inclusive environment um, one of the initiatives that we're going to be working on is is we are going to be our team and they're doing this internally without me leading the initiative um, is going to look are going to create a, a DEI plan um, but also we're looking at our decision making framework as an organization how do we make sure that one person or the same people are not making every decision without there being voice um, being uh, there there's an opportunities for people to provide input and have some influence influence over changes um, if we want to get louder and start creating macro level change how do we get our voice out there um, and that's, as I mentioned, one of the larger, um, you know, strategies. Um, well, we had a funder that um, has provided full funding for a, a pretty large social marketing campaign that you're going to be seeing in a few weeks. So there are very tangible, specific um, uh, uh, things that we're going to be working on to get us closer to, the, to accomplishing those strategic directions that we've shared. Thanks. I don't know if... Dee, did you want to add anything? I have follow-up questions, but I want to make some space. Only if you wanted me to. I think uh, Charlotte and Charles were uh, very eloquent. Yeah, I think one of the things um, that I think I'm curious to hear you all talk about is just thinking about, um, we talk a lot about lately this year, just the challenge that our city faces and wanting to really get to the root of these problems. And this is something that ATC cannot do alone. However, I, I did want people to reflect on what are ATC's particular strengths? What's special about ATC? And what, what do we see as ATC's role in really pushing the needle on these challenges, on, these, um, on this humanitarian crisis, to quote um, Charles, who's been quoted already on that. And, yeah, just what what is special about ATC and what like what can ATC do that maybe some other organizations can't and like what holes are we filling? Well, I don't know about ATC, but I know on an individual level, I've solved homelessness. Uh, the answer to homelessness is giving people homes, um, and I think we put I think we have a lot of different programs and a lot of people operating them. Um, in silo and we're putting money towards the wrong solutions i think and i think that comes from a fundamental idea that people aren't worthy of housing because it actually doesn't make sense like there's no reason you can say out loud aloud that someone shouldn't have housing um and so <laughs> to pivot back to your question um, what I enjoy about my work with ATC and I think what separates us is I think we have a very common sense approach to things. Um, Charles has alluded to this. I think we have compassion in our work. I think we make sure that through an intensive hiring process that we get people that are mission driven and uh, we prioritize our clients. And I've touched on this earlier, but the fact we don't have a finish line we work with clients well into their 30s. Um, we start working with people in their teens and 20s. 
Um, and that allows us to build consistency in relationships. Because I also think it's a little presumptuous to believe you can come into someone's life for a short period of time and change it. I think that we provide that consistent support and that model makes sense to me. I think it's humanistic and I think it addresses root problems and a lack of support people have in their communities and lives. And it works to create leadership as opposed to making people jump through hoops or fit a certain mold. So I think in doing that, that's kind of like our greatest strength as an organization. Yeah, I, I would just say Dee's right. I mean, you know, I would love to see ATC be worked out of at least some of the business, quote unquote business, right? Or that we, that we have half the work that we have now. Um, I still think that people um, are gonna need support. They're gonna need relationships. They're gonna need long-term relationships. They're gonna need people to help them navigate uh, or support them in navigating their lives. And especially, you know, some some of the challenges they encounter. Um, but at the end of the day, we shouldn't have to worry about making sure people have a food. We shouldn't have to worry about them having hygiene materials like that. Like all the work that we do on that, we shouldn't even have to do. We should be able to focus our energies elsewhere. Um, but Mario, you asked this question earlier about sort of big vision and like, you know, there might be people who say like, really, like what is one small nonprofit going to do in terms of uh, eradicating homelessness, right? Um, we're not going to be able to do it alone. Um, so I think that in the meantime, the most important thing is is that um, people show up, um, you know, in the lives of people who maybe people haven't shown up, and make sure that folks know that they're cared about, that they're seen, um, that people are trying to, um, you know, push for solutions and push for change because nobody should be living on the streets, much less dying on them, and that's the reality of what happens. And we don't like to sometimes sit with that, but people are dying on our streets. Um, and I, I think, quite frankly, um, you know, we're all in some way, um, and it's not a popular thing to say, we're kind of complicit in, in those losses. And I, in good faith, and nor do I think any of us should, and we can all find our ways to be part of the solution, but I, I can't good, in good faith just ignore that dynamic. Um, so. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from the audience, which is about our community and kind of how we can leverage our community who is full of people who like to volunteer their time. Um, and I think this is a great question and I wanted to kind of ask it and then also ask a broader question about, you know, engage, getting people engaged and involved. Um, so the question is just, you, do we feel like we're maximizing um, the resource of volunteers in San Francisco? And are we considering other ways to tap into that resource and kind of maximize the benefit of it for ATC and for our clients? Um, thanks for that question, Eleanor. And I think that's a great question. I think um, the other thing I just wanted to tack onto it was just thinking about, you know, what is ATC's invitation to people to get engaged? Because as you said, Charles, it, it can't just be at the crossroads. Um, it, it is going to take, you know, many different organizations, many different people, a community at large kind of coming together. And so, you know, what is our, our challenge or our invitation to, we've got 20 people right now on this call, but we also have a broader community of people who really care about the work that ATC does and, and about um, building a more equitable Bay Area. So I'd love to hear you all address some of these questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I was shaking my head no, and I, I, I had seen the question, uh, Eleanor, and uh, we're absolutely not um, leveraging uh, the support from um, the community in the way I would like to, I think all of us would like to see it. And so, um, so I hope, and this is part of sort of staying engaged, I hope that this won't be the last part of the conversation we have with you about this, because um, certainly COVID has influenced this to a certain extent. We did have office volunteer opportunities, people could you know, do the hike each year. There were like ways to like, you know, get friends involved in that. Um, certainly in kind support, we always need in kind support and doing uh, donation drives, warm clothing drives. Um, um, but with that said, I do think that um, certainly hopefully on the other end of COVID, 
we would really like to think about how we can build our volunteer base. And we're gonna need some help with sort of strategizing on how to do that with some of the restrictions we have as an organization in terms of privacy of clients, um, bandwidth, and with, bandwidth within the organization. However, we have a lot of initiatives and a lot of projects we're working on coming up and that may not be a fit for everybody, but we're looking at taking our marketing and our PR to the next level. And we're, look, we're exploring doing um, some rebranding. Um, we're, we have this data collection project, but this is a long-term need that the organization has. Um, we have IT needs. We have, you know, sometimes we need HR counsel. I mean, there's a lot of things that potentially people have expertise in out in the community that they could do some get involved that way, which might not be the best way for folks. But um, those are more immediate sort of opportunities that we will be sharing over the next uh, coming over the next several months. Um, but we we do want to build a community and engage them in new ways. That's definitely one of our major goals over the next couple of years. Um, I don't have much to say. I think Charles um, put really put it well. Um, one thing I do think is in terms of using our community, I think one thing we've seen or that I've seen over the years is that our volunteers are very committed. I think we have a core of very committed people that are also very talented and they're always looking for more ways to contribute to the organization. And I definitely want to figure out ways to leverage that. And also, um, this is uh, someone touched upon it earlier. I think that we've not put ourselves out there as much in terms of what Charles was saying about marketing and PR. I think we need a larger profile. I think hopefully if um, the volunteers we do have are, are an indicator, it's that when people do learn what we do and they do work with us, they um, are very mission driven and they're very committed and any ways that we can leverage that for our clients, I think we should be open to. Yeah, I appreciate both of your input. And I also just wanna say that I think um, it, you know, we, we have these skill-based volunteer opportunities. We also just wanna invite you to reach out if you have ideas, you know, we may not be able to implement them all. We are a small team, um, but we do love to hear from you. And I think in a lot of ways, just being a compassionate member of, of your community also has an impact and, you know, spreading the word about ATC, but also just, you know, being friendly to the people who live near you, whether or not they are housed or unhoused and kind of showing up for your community um, goes a long way. But I also think that at the Crossroads is taking a direction where we will be having more opportunities and we will be putting calls out to the community to maybe use your voice or whatever it is. And that we're hoping that, you know, you and our larger community will kind of come come out when we have those opportunities for engagement. We don't quite know what they are yet, but we know that they there will be opportunities in that vein. And so right now at least, um, stay tuned, but please reach out and also please, you know, spread the word about ATC if you believe in what we do and, and the work that we're doing. Did you wanna add something, Charles? I felt like you were ready to say something. No, I, I was just, uh, you know, like the gala, for example, this last year was our first and, um, and you know, it's oh, another gala. And it was called a gala. We debated whether we wanted to call it a gala or not. But really, the purpose of that event was was that we, we want to provide and we may not call it a gala next time. It's sort of a sneak peek. Maybe we won't call it gala next time we do it. For those that are on the phone, you'll be the first to hear that. Um, but we really wanted, we really wanted an opportunity just to bring all of our supporters, like our extended family into the same room together. Although unfortunately now we don't know if that will happen, but because like there's something really powerful as you were saying, Mari, uh, like I tell people, please email, call, like let me know what's on your mind. It is really um, supportive. And even if it's critical feedback, you know, it's, 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 uh, it really supports us and helps us forge ahead on doing the work that we do. So um, so I would encourage people, don't be strangers. Great. Well, we're, 
we've got five minutes left, but we don't have to use them all. There are no more questions in the Q&A. So if, if anyone who's on the call, oh, I see that Clive has oh, raised, maybe not. <laughs> I saw someone raise their hand. Um, if you have any more questions, please, please pop them in the chat. Um, I do want to open it up just to any of you, Charles, Demaria, or Charlotte, if you have any final thoughts, closing, closing thoughts, parting words, anything, you, anything you want to inspire our participants today with? Well, I have a song. Oh, yeah? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have, no, I have nothing. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, it's really, um, I always enjoy these opportunities to be able to kind of connect even if it's through Zoom, even if I can't see any of your faces, just because I don't really see anyone these days. So talking to people is nice. Um, and also just wanna thank um, the team as well for the work they've been able to do and the consistency they've been able to provide um, during this crisis. Um, well, now you have to produce a song. Yeah, uh, you we've put it got a request uh, from the audience. <laughs> well, what you no, can think no. about the song because I'm going to say I'm going to say one more thing and then you can lead us out and maybe sing us out. <laughs> okay, uh, I got you. I, there's got to be an inspirational song that we can sing on, on the way out. But um, the the one thing I'll just uh, leave on that came up a little bit earlier is this idea of um, I think one of the 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 things that we that we can do it at the crossroads and our community can do is is even just put out the world that we want to see out there. And I know that seems really sort of I don't know what adjective you want to use, but it's always surprising to me that some of the things that I say, especially in you know citywide meetings or in meetings with lots of bureaucrats and people even in the field that are doing the work, um, when I say like chronic homelessness should be eliminated. Every single person should have house, a house. It's unacceptable and it's unacceptable that people go to bed hungry. Um, you know, th these things, like I'm not even sure there's full consensus around it, but at the end of the day, I also see it as our role to just put out into the world, the world we want to see, because quite frankly, the only way to could, like the only way to make that world happen is to actually like create a vision and like work towards it. Um, so I, I do think that that's, that's, that's uh, one of the things that's so special about our organization is, is I, I think the way that we want to see the world is the right way the world should be. Um, and we're going to stick with that. So um, I don't know if D, oh, D, did you get your, uh, your list of songs? Oh, yeah, it's ready. Okay. Should, 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 should I play us out? <laughs> you can play us out, D. Uh, oh, I can't play you out. Oh no. <laughs> Technical difficulties. You got to give me a second. All right, Charlotte, did you want to say anything? Did, did you want to chime in? Yes. Yes, I can be the, uh, what's the right word? The the hype, the hype woman for D. Um, no, I just wanted to thank you all for also joining us. I think this is, I'm really looking forward to going on this journey with ATC. And, um, you know, I hope that you'll, you'll join us along for the ride. And I just wanted to also just um, recognize Charles for his leadership throughout this year that probably feels like a century, but uh, the way that he's led this organization has been inspiring and I've learned a lot watching him. So thank you, Charles, and, and thank you, Dee and Mari and Carson, who's sort of the behind the scenes producer of this event and, and all the, the ATC staff are doing Yeoman's work with, you know, just um, relentless perseverance and dedication. So on behalf of where we thank you all um, and we look forward to more of these. I think we're all used to these sort of Zooms or meets or hangouts, whatever we wanna call it. Um, it's now a way of life and it's actually really cool that we can connect in this way. So I'm looking forward to more of these opportunities to just chat with you all. Um, Dee, you got it going? You ready? <laughs> I'm not gonna sing though, I'll play a sap though. <laughs> well, thank you. I wanna thank everybody and thanks Dee for the song. <laughs> the quiet song. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, take care and stay dry. And uh, yeah, close this out. Thank y'all.
Bye, everyone. Thank you.